Welcome to the Governance Evaluator Conversation About Governance series. I'm Ian Cover, and in this series I'll be chatting with a range of individuals who will bring us their personal perspective on the everyday side of governance. Welcome to the Governance Evaluator podcast series. I'm Ian Cover, and today it's a great pleasure to welcome a very special guest, Dr. Rob Moody. Hello, Rob. How are you? Ian, I'm very well. Good. Now, I know who you are, but there might be viewers out there that don't know who you are. So can I just quickly give you the full intro? If you like. Right. Uh, Rob has a background as a professor of public health at the Melbourne School of Population Health, University of Melbourne. Also Professor of Public Health at the College of Medicine, University of Malawi, was CEO of Vic Health for eight years and held a number of board chair roles, including National Preventative Health Task Force in Australia for three years, the Melbourne Storm for five years, and is currently chair of the Garvey Vaccine Alliance's Evaluation Advisory Committee. And uh, he's got a very long business card to fit all that on the business <laughs> card, especially the, that uh, Garvey vaccine job, and also advises the World Health Organization in the areas of non-communicable diseases and health promotion. Have I left anything out, Rob? Ah, uh, you've got all, that's enough, I think. Yeah. That's enough. <laughs> to run with, yeah. And we're particularly interested yeah. uh, today as part of this uh, series to talk about governance yep. and having been a board chair yep. and also a CEO where yep. you have to work with boards. Um, there's going to be plenty of ground to cover. I do know, Rob, uh, we go back a long way. This, it seems like in this series I'm going to be introducing guests and saying, we well, go right. back a long way every time. <laughs> but we do go back more than 20 years to when you were CEO of Vic Health. Yep. And uh, it's great to catch up with you again, and of course, more recently with some things for Malawi. But let's cut straight to the sure. chase um, and talk about um, your time as chairman of Melbourne Storm. Right. Yep. I think this is probably a, a great case study in itself for governance evaluation. Uh, w- just give us the time you were chairman of Mel- Melbourne Storm. Uh, 2006 to 2010. Right. Uh, so I'd come onto the board the year before. Um, and a friend of mine, Peter Ma, uh, had sort of encouraged me to come onto the board. I uh, started to obviously learn about the board and then uh, they were looking for a chair because the news representatives were keen to step back um, and uh, I, uh, I stepped forward, I guess, or I was the only one standing. But uh, uh, I took on that role and, and obviously over the several years, um, things were going very well until obviously uh, 2010 when the salary cap, uh, we actually learned about it. Yeah. And so you started out as a, just as a board member, yeah, but yeah. you made it to the role of chairman. Yeah. Did, did, and did, did you know much about Melbourne Storm or rugby well, league before I, you went on? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, I yeah. played rugby league. Oh, did, did you? Yeah, no, I'd played in, uh, uh, in Newcastle in the under four stone sevens. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're hardly big enough to, uh, uh, to wear a shirt. Uh, and actually, I'd also played uh, in Central Australia because I worked in the... Uh, uh, for an Aboriginal medical service for about five years. I played with the Blackfellas side up there. Mm. Um, and uh, um, so I knew quite a lot about rugby league. I obviously played rugby union for years mm. since I was you know, um, all through school and all through university. Mm. Um, and But it was quite interesting. And then went on to the rugby league, and it's obviously quite a, it's a tussle between union and league. Mm. Um you know, almost a sort of class war, if you like, but I just really enjoyed my time at the Storm and it was, having just been to the game yesterday, even though I lost, I have enormous respect for the people that that, uh, that run the place now and the people that have sort of run, that have been the central part of it through all that time. So when you were asked to be the chairman, yeah. you felt reasonably well equipped to be the chair? I can't say that's true. I mean, I think that um, in many instances... Uh, board members and board chairs are underprepared um, and underskilled for the for the challenges that they they um, they like. I mean, I'd chaired a number of uh, boards up until that time, and obviously I'd been a CEO. But one of a commercial venture and you know, sporting commercial, uh, they are they are much in a sense much trickier. They're much more in the public light um, public realm. So. Um, you know, you've really got to rely on other people uh, and you've really got to work with others who may have um, more skills than you do. That doesn't matter. Use them as best you can. So anyway, so you become chair yep. and everything's going well because yep. the, the storm was we're successful the, yeah, on the winning yeah, premierships. Yeah, yeah. 
And then our, our well, the CEO at the time um, decides to move. The acting CEO takes over. He comes and tells me um, on April the 13th, 2010, I can remember it, <laughs> um, you know, that the books have been cooked for the last uh, few years. Uh, there's a problem. Uh, what are we going to do about it? And so... Um, and that was the first you knew of it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And 11 days later, the world knew about it. So yeah. it wasn't a question of us... Uh, Hiding, and I can tell you, it was, a, it was a really uncomfortable time. I mean, when you're faced with that that knowledge, what what do you do? Um, how do you manage it? Um, and I don't think I managed it particularly well. I mean, I think that that um, we were in a very difficult position because, in fact, News Limited owned the board, and they or they owned the club, and they also owned NRL, so they were in a tremendous situation of conflict. So, um, as was said to me, you know. Managing something like this, there's um, there's no recipe for how you do it. Mm. And so, uh, the outsiders when they hear this sure. break, yeah. uh, the public, for example, and I suppose the media, they start asking sure. questions. And, and and whether it's you oh. or any other board, they must. The people, obviously, people said, surely you knew exactly. No, no, what and, was going and, on, and quite rightly. I mean, I think that that you know, I would have probably said the same thing. I mean, uh, I mean, the point was that that you know. One of the other directors was the you know, chief of, fi- uh, of finance at, at Herald Weekly Times, so you know a deep understanding of of, uh, uh, of what was going on. But we had internal audits, mm. we had external audits. You know, we had three different forms of accountability, and it still didn't find it was you know it still wasn't found out until um, uh, the acting CEO came and basically said, "This is what's been going on." Um, and it was interesting because after that, when it came out. Um, in fact, sort of senior people from the business world, one in particular, who who uh, emailed me and said, "Look, in this situation, if you've got someone who's really out to defraud, then by the time you find out, generally speaking, it's too late." And unfortunately, it was too late for us to sort of do direct, um, you know, remedial work in in uh, uh, in that time. So we had to suffer the consequences of public exposure, and, and I. And I actually don't, I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, I think that as Peter Myers said, you know, we went up to Sydney to see the NRL on a shoplifting charge and came back uh, with a murder charge. <laughs> so, you know, it was slightly it was very serious. Yeah. And they didn't, they, they actually didn't, they didn't do, give us due process. Um, uh, so I think that was pretty tough. On the other hand, you know, two years later, we won a premiership. Mm. You know, another five years later, another premiership. Mm. Just been the, in the, you know, Grand final for the last three years, and I take my hat off to the Craig Bellamy's mm-hmm. and the Frank Panese's and, and the new chair, Bart uh, Campbell and Dave Donahue, the, the CEO. Very good people. So, so, a couple of questions arising out sure. of that. The first one is uh, to people that might be chairing board or on a board or sure. any, anyone that's you know uh, viewing this uh, podcast. Is there some way that boards can prepare themselves for that eventuality, or? or be aware of the, that sort of potential risk? How do you go about even, you know, not managing the, the well, happening but stopping it happening? Sure. Well, I mean, A, you know, my, the lesson I've got of this is, you know, beware of um, overly charismatic CEOs, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Rule number one, you know, just, just and and I think, you know, you have to be careful about, about in a sense, people are sort of either over-promising or, you, you know, if you've got a sense that um, something's wrong, then, then follow that. You know, mm. track it down, uh, and I think that's probably where we didn't track that nearly. You know, we sort of believed in the success, and which was absolutely legitimate, as as shown by the success two years later. But you know, you have to follow your hunches more strongly. I mean, we certainly, we certainly, you know, we were we were looking at all the audits, and we were mm. we were really you know delving deep, but uh, obviously not deep enough. Mm. And so, uh, uh, apart from that happening, sure. which you, you obviously had no awareness of or yeah. control over it happening. Uh, every other other aspect of your board activities, you were happy with. Uh, oh, generally speaking, yeah. but I mean, I I probably didn't put enough work in. I think of what I've learned even more um, with other boards now. The board I'm doing with the Global Vaccine Alliance um, in Geneva is is that in fact the chair has to put the most work in. Right. There's absolutely no doubt about that. The chair's got to put the work in and make sure you know a everybody else is working well um but also you know your role is much more as a as a conductor rather than necessarily trying to be 
every part of the orchestra. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm learning. I've learned a lot over the last few years, I think, and I really appreciate the fact that the better I get to that role of, of orchestration rather than, than uh, you know, having my opinion win out mm. uh, or, or trying to run the show, uh, then you get a much better outcome. And, and the second question that you touched on a few moments ago too is that it is a, a credit to the board that replaced your board yeah. that they're able to keep that club on track and, yeah. and become successful. Yeah. What, so what did they do to change things or improve things? Or And obviously on the playing side of things, with under coach Craig Bellamy, they had a great culture and that's obviously been able to be maintained. Absolutely. absolutely. And that, that was always there mm. uh, and, it, and it's maintained. I mean, in, in many ways it's been shown and, you know, that we, we didn't, you know, the CEO previously I didn't need to do these machinations to to uh, uh, keep people on board. I mean, in fact, the club's done very well by virtue of of Bellamy's approach. And you know, I love the sort of the four values that they have, which is which is um, you know a very strong work ethic, respect, selfless acts, and humility. Mm. Um, and you know, generally speaking, until it wasn't so evident last night, they, they sort of lost composure. But uh, generally speaking, it's been that's Bellamy's way of doing work, and Frank Panisi, who works with him, and, um, and, and really and, balanced people. Are those values? Hmm. Are they just developed by the the, the playing side of the organisation, yeah. or yeah. or does the, the the board had a role in that, or can boards have a role in that I sort think, of leadership? I think boards can. In this yeah. case, it's it's definitely in a sense the the um, the playing group that's developed that, but if you look at you know how successful um, you know the current chair is now, he's got you know Jerry Ryan who was on our was on the board previously, still on the board, so there's continuity, uh, and obviously he's you know he's a major sort of uh, entrepreneur as well, so he's got a very good, uh, very very good business brain, and now they've got Dave Donaghy who's the the CEO, he was in fact the media manager when we were going through this whole. Uh, a whole <laughs> catastrophe, actually. He had a tough gig. He had a tough gig. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember being in front of uh, thirty journos, fifteen cameras. You know, everybody baying for my blood. It was, it was very uncomfortable. Dave is very, very balanced, and it's interesting to watch good, good people like good footballers. They maintain poise and balance, so you get pushed off, and everybody's going to get pushed over at some stage mm-hmm. in your business career or on a ball. Or something. Something's going to happen. Uh, it's a question of how quickly can, in a sense, you come back to the, to the, to the, to the upright so you can function well. You know, the, the longer you're off balance, um, the worse you do. Mm-hmm. And would it be uh, good advice too to give to uh, people on boards to uh, always, you know, look ahead and and focus on the future rather than worrying too much about. What negative happened. things that might yeah. happen. Yeah, well, I mean, because I think, that could have happened there, couldn't it? Absolutely. But I mean, the point is, I think you've got to, you know, you've got to take risks seriously. You've mm-hmm. got to, because that's part of the the organisation uh, the future, um, but not be obsessed by it. I mean, in a sense, if you're you're so focused on risk, then you won't actually create uh, and you won't move forward. But on the other hand, you've got to be careful. You've got to be listening. Uh, you've got to be watching. I mean, obviously, the the role of the board is to and the role of the CEO is to develop a, a mutually very strong relationship. I mean, I was very lucky when I was at Vic Health, um, so I was I was CEO for about nine years, and that that was a fabulous time. I had John Funder and then Jane Fenton as chairs. Uh, they were very um, very supportive. We had a good relationship. We had MPs on it like Hugh Delahunty, mm. um, uh, you know, very supportive, good people that understood people like Lindsay Gaze. I mean. Um, very, very, uh, Elaine Candy, uh, good people that were supportive, but, you know, I think you, you've got to develop a, a very effective sort of mutually supportive relationship. And not focus or, or be, be dragged down by potential no, negatives I mean, or... Have, you know, have your sense of understanding what the risks are of the organisation and mitigate them. Um, and every so often, you know, for example, you'll get a reputational risk. You say, well... And manage it well, manage it quickly and well. Did you ever hear anecdotally or the, about um, other sports clubs yeah. that's brought out, not just rugby league sure. clubs, but who, who might have immediately the storm uh, storm erupted? Right. Uh, the blackest all, day, right, yeah. yeah. All, all hurriedly, uh, you know, 
Look at their books. Looked at their own situations. Well, I mean, there's always... Would have wake up called everyone. Well, I mean, you know, Manly were fine 750000 a week, you know, three weeks ago, a week ago. I mean, it's um, obviously, you know, the whole notion of how people try and fit the salary cap. I mean, I think until they actually say, OK, we'll have a look at the, the uh, uh, tax records of our players mm. um, and somehow get around the, the agents... Uh, then they're going to find it pretty hard to, to really police strongly. But uh, that's a that's the problem that you have with a, an issue like a solo cap. Yeah, but, but it's also a, a, a problem for non-sporting organisations. Oh, yeah. So it's just about the, the, the financial yeah, yeah. responsibility and As we've been integrity. seeing with yeah. the banks, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, that uh, when, when, you know, when you've got a drive like happened obviously with our CEO at, uh, at the Storm for... Going beyond the ethical, in a sense, you know, form of greed or narcissism, then you know you 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 do get in trouble. So any sense of that going on in either on your board or or within your executive, then you really want to have a good look at it. Mm-hmm. Now, let's talk a little bit more about uh, your time as a CEO. Yep. And uh, you mentioned there about the great relationship you had with your your, your chairs. Yep. And. Um, was that something that sort of evolved, or did the board of Vic Health have a you know certain way of doing things? Well, yeah, I mean the initial chair was Gus Nossel. I mean, and Rhonda Galvalli was the was the CEO. Mm-hmm. Um, then I transitioned after Rhonda and John Funder had come in. Um, I mean, just to go back a bit for me, I guess is that I'd previously been working um, for UNAIDS, which is the, the UN. Uh, Joint Programme and AIDS. So I'd started that in 95 as the first director of, of country programs. Mm. So we had to start this new UN program in 80 countries overnight, right? Sure. So I was there because I knew about HIV, right? And I've been working there for a number of years, but not because I actually knew about management and leadership. So I actually found that incredibly hard um, and very taxing. But that's when I started to learn about the whole issue around leadership skills and management skills that we don't teach in public health or in medicine or in, you know, the hospital system, really. You know, we're, we're, we often put people who are technically very good into leadership roles, and I was a really good example of that. Okay. Um, and But I did learn from that experience in Geneva about, you know, okay, I've got some deficiencies, uh, I've got some strengths, but I really need to work on these. And I fortunately had a guy there that really helped me. Um, and that's where I really got interested in... in leadership skills um, and how to develop them. And, and that's when I came to Big Health, well, a, a smaller organisation, and, and I was able to, to learn and, and, in a sense, poor guys that work with me, practice. <laughs> but, but, but it sounds like it's largely self-taught. Do you think, do you think we need... Yeah. Do we need people to actually oh. teach people like you that come in with the Absolutely. practical skills yeah. but not the leadership yeah. ones? No, I mean, it's now that within... You know, now that I'm teaching at Melbourne Uni, I actually teach these. We've made these compulsory skills. So it's even now within the medical course, they're starting to think about bringing in leadership skills. And whether it's decision making or problem solving or networking or time management or um, you know managing people, managing conflict. I mean, you ask the number of people in in our area and who you know who are good at man- you know, managing conflict. <laughs> Everybody wants to run a mile. It's too, you know, <laughs> managing people is tough, um, and but we need to learn how to do it well. And do you think we need to teach board members how to be absolutely. better board members? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I think because, I mean, it is interesting. And I know from my experience when I was on the Vic Health board, uh, when I was at Vic Health, and, and some of the really good, you know, like really experienced people would be, you know, they were sort of felt really uncomfortable because of the other skills of the board members, mm. you know, might have been around health or, or research. And they felt, well, you know, by virtue of their position, they weren't, they weren't skilled enough, but they were there for other reasons. And and we didn't really have that discussion about, well, you know, what are you good at? What am I good at? How do we complement each other's skills? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, is there, was Lindsay Gaze yeah. on that board? Yeah. Is there a good story about Lindsay? Well, yeah, I mean, Lindsay, you know, one of the icons of Australian sport, you know, uh, both as a player and then a, a coach. Basketball and, and legend. father, basketball yeah. legend. Yeah. Um, and I remember him sort of saying that he felt, you know, really quite... Um, not uncomfortable, but but uh, um, you know not really confident when he's talking to you know other medical people who may have been around the board who you know had a you know a much more sophisticated knowledge of of the research and health promotion issues. But you know Lindsay was there because of his incredible depth in in 
how sport works, and obviously Vic Health has a lot to do with sport. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, and that in itself uh, obviously leads to the fact that the makeup of boards then need a wide range of yeah. skills, experience, background, and and I think complementary. You know, yeah. the fact that you don't need. In fact, you want to have a, a good range of skills on the board. And, and personally, from my own experience now of teaching leadership and management skills, is you want them to start to know who, each other's skills um, and strengths and also weaknesses. Mm. You know, areas that people don't feel strong. Uh, on the other hand, finding out what people are good at, you can then tap into their skills. Mm. But if you don't know, you know, if you've never actually discussed that amongst yourselves about what you're good at and what, you know, what you're not particularly good at and what they're good at, then it's very hard to sort of do a trade, you know, and build up a sense of what the group's really good at. Mm -hmm. uh, because you'll find everybody puts their cards on the table. There's a lot of skills in the room. How do we make use of them? And, and at the moment, there seems to be a lot of turnover on boards. Yeah. And Is this an opportunity with, to, to, to do this resetting of boards? I think so. I mean, it's something that uh, I think if you could bring, as someone's coming in, now, that's a good time for people just to sit around, have a talk to each other, find out about each other, and you'll find that the people that are on the board already start to know about each other as well. But we mostly know people prospectively. In other words, you know them from, you know, you probably, you know, every new person, well, not there been all that many new people that could have been, but you know, when they come in, you know, Andy comes in, you say, well, you know him from then on. Yeah, yeah. You don't actually know them terribly well. I mean, you're a bit different, but... Uh, and their, their, their backgrounds, their likes, their dislikes, their preferences. When you find that, I think, about people, uh, it's a really powerful way of building a good team. Is that the thing you call the skills matrix? Sort of. Yes. Sort of? That's exactly. I mean, it's a sense of, of finding out what people are, are good at um, and where they're not so good at and, and how they feel about that as well, I think. Because it's not only... Because well, people will rate themselves differently. Um, mm. Uh, but a sense of, of actually being able to acknowledge yourself, look, this is what I'm good at. Uh, I think also if you can acknowledge to your other board members, look, I'm good at this, but I'm not particularly, it's not a strength, just as Lindsay did, but um, to know each other's uh, strengths um, and preferences and likes is a really powerful way of, of building a board and building, to, and you know, a board's a really good, example of a, of a team and looking at the way uh, boards seem to be going at the moment with turnover and yep. a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, two things gender balance yep. and business background yeah yeah uh, do you have any thoughts about the makeup of boards and whether they are you know yeah. ideal at the moment or going forward as they say rob yeah <laughs> moving forward um i mean i think again you've got to get you know, you've got to work out what the, the nature of the business is, the, sort of the enterprise is, if you like, uh, and make sure that there are people on the board that can cover pretty, you know, all the bases uh, that you need. And that's why having a, a matrix is, is a really good thing because you can sort of pick up what is needed and, and, you know, maybe we'll, you know, we're deficient in this area, well, we need to recruit a new member who's got those skills. Um, and primarily also want to find people who've got good team skills. Mm -hmm. You know, you, don't know, you not only want a good bunch of leaders, you want a good bunch of team members. And I think people who are good team members are always, you know, good leaders are always good team members. Um, and so actually finding them and building that sort of picture so that, you know, you, you're covering all the things that you need, I think is incredibly important for a board. I mean, it's also important for the, for the chair, again, to their role is about making sure the team play as well. I mean, they're, they're the captain, they're the coach. Um, if they're not paying attention to the whole team, uh, then they're probably not doing their job properly. And are you still chair boards at the minute? Are you still chairing anything? Well, what am I, I'm just chairing a new startup called Healthy Futures Australia yeah. um, and uh, I'm chairing the evaluation uh, advisor group in Geneva for, for the Vaccine Alliance. And that's an interesting, like there's some seriously smart people on that board. Hmm. way smarter than me. Um, but the question is, how do you use their talent? And also, you know, you can often find people um, uh, that 
you know, how different. I mean, there's a, a friend of mine who works in this area, Jason Clark, who talks about the idea framework, which is the imaginers, the developers, the evaluators, and the actors, right? So there's different sorts of people that work in a group. And there's always the evaluators. The, 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 what they call the... Yeah, I'll write this down. What's the the evaluators? <laughs> the, 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 I dot, the yeah. T crosses and the I dotters, right? right? So they can potentially put a block on everything you do. But, I mean, if you get someone like that that acts like that, they can be incredibly useful because they're really asking good questions rather than saying, well, you know, stop asking questions that stopping us moving forward, saying, well, you know, maybe we can really learn from what questions are being asked and make sure we can uh, answer them effectively. What was my second one? What was after evaluators? Well, it was idea. It was uh, imaginers, developers, imaginers. Yeah, developers yeah. evaluators, and uh, actors. Yeah. Actors? Yeah, as in Rambo, you know. I'll get things done. done. Yeah, yeah, you know, oh. sort of. Not, not as in... Uh, uh, playing the role. Of, no, 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 no. Or playing the role or of a board member. <laughs> <laughs> True, no, no, yeah. Rather than actually no, really, no, really actually, putting... Yeah. I mean, it's more in a, in a formation of a team or a group. Yeah. Um, but that, that thing, this, that were, my view when you said actors was about people that come onto the board and they think, oh, well, I'll just act yeah, as a yeah, board member. Yeah, yeah. And, and that still goes on, yeah, unfortunately, especially yeah. I think in the sports sphere where... You, you feel as though you have to, you know, take a part. Yeah, or, and, or some people that want to be on a sports board so they can rub shoulders well, with the stars. Well, maybe Linneman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Liniment uh, uh, addicts, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. No, I, I, that's true. And again, I guess it's the, as people are being recruited, is actually to pick up what's the sentiment, you know, why do they want to be there um, and finding that out and then making people feel comfortable about what they are trying to do because, again, that's a great role of the chair is to help people feel comfortable so they don't actually have to, you know, set up a, sort of a, a, an image of themselves um, and appear... As they're not, you know, as they really aren't. You know. And there's another thing I've heard you talk about too, might be uh, um, worth talking about now, is mm. about skilling up. I mean, you can bring yeah. all these things to a board, yeah. but th- then there's this thing called skilling up. What's that all about? Well, I mean, if in a sense you find out that there are a number of areas where you're very good uh, and there's areas you're not so good at, and it's actually, you think that's important in terms of the mix that. You know, you need to develop your skills, and it may be great because it'll help your confidence. I mean, it'll help your contribution to the board anyway. Is how do you go around developing those skills? And you can do two things. I mean, a you can also develop even more the skills that you're good at, because that may be a very useful thing for for the board or for the for whomever you're working with. Uh, and also, you can work on skills you're not very good at. Now, I was never a particularly good decision maker, right? <laughs> But I got help on how to make decisions. And uh, again, the guy I was working with um, um, in Geneva, he took me through, look, this is how you make decisions. Uh, and it just made it, because I was born on a fence, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look over there, oh, yeah, they're right. And you look over, oh, no, they're right, you know, yeah. just the way you are, you know. And some people see the world in black and white, and I think that's sort of easier in a way. Um, but I think, you know, learning skills or learning skills about conf- about how to manage conflict you know, understanding what forms of, of um, conflict there are and how you manage that. Or how do, you, how do you go through difficult conversations with people? You know, how do you coach people? Uh, how do you mentor them? All these fundamental skills. How do you manage your time? You know, how do you make sure that you're not spending all your time on non-important, non-urgent things and actually start to think about uh, what is really important in your in your business or in your board or in your, your day-to-day work. I figure a lot of people watching this podcast uh, are on boards. Yep. It might even, even be just with a local sporting club yeah. or, or a, and, even, even the school council. And great, yeah. yeah. Um, but right through the, the top end business yeah, sure, and, and sure. elite sport or in, in health organisations, yeah. whatever. Uh, but they're largely domestic yep. things here in yep. Australia. But you're doing things that have uh, – Offices and uh, organi- outfits as part of the organisation all around the world. Yeah. Uh, how do those boards manage to, you know, bring everything together when things are so <laughs> spread diverse, out? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting that that um, you know, sort of boards or committees or you know, groups. Um, when you're working in a very international you know, setting, and, and I love doing that, I've loved it for years. You know, every every group I sit around is I always count the number of people and how many nationalities are around mm-hmm. the board, and the more the merrier from my perspective. But you know, you've got to work out sort of how do we communicate with each other. Uh, you know, what's the what's the culture of the board? 
Uh, and I guess there's sort of developed an international culture, I guess, where you know you can generally pick up how to work with people and how to management and how do people respond to each other. Um, but you just have to be more acute to the fact that you've got a much more diverse group around the table than than you would otherwise have. And, and in answering those questions you had before about you know how do I use the Managed time? Exactly. Because yeah. It mustn't be easy to get everyone together in the one place. Well, there's that. No, and also <laughs> telecom. I mean, it's interesting because we've been I've been working with a group in Malawi actually, an international research group, and one of their big things is because one of the things I've been teaching is how to chair a meeting. Right. Right. I mean, this is we spend an amazing amount of time in meetings. I'm going to. And we. At the Kuta Beans, we have about one meeting a year. I know. I and know. I have to chair it, so I'm going to well, take notes now. <laughs> but the point is, I mean, uh, you know, we can waste so much time by virtue of them being badly run. Mm. Um, and I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity to, to fundamentally learn very, you know, basic skills that help people manage each other. And I think just from my own experience, Dan, of working in international situations a lot um, and, you know, recently working a lot in Malawi, uh, and Mozambique um, is that there's probably the way we relate to each other is sort of like you know 80 percent which is sort of universal and 20 percent which is you know highly contextual depending on the you know the, the culture you're you're working in mm. so there's a lot that's actually I think pretty transferable from country to country place to place about how good business is good boards work um, but there's still quite a lot that's contextual mm. And so the, the, the work you're doing in Malawi yeah. is around training people to be doctors? Uh, no, it's actually, well, I went there first as a volunteer just to help with their Masters of Public Health program okay. and help run that. And that was great fun, a great learning experience for, for me. Um, and then I've been te- doing this teaching leadership and management skills to health professionals, to researchers, to nurses uh, in the hospital, to, to doctors. Um, I mean, there, you know, doctors do six years of medicine, then they do 18 months of an internship at the hospital, and then they're the district medical officer right. running a, a, a hospital and a, and a regional health service, you know, which, which probably has a third of the resources or less than it needs. So, I mean, they have high turnover because, you know, it's like sending a, teaching someone to be a, a nurse and then sending them out to do um Neurosurgery. Okay. I mean, you've got to we've got to skill people up for the jobs they do. Mm. But also, if they've done the training and then you send them out, yeah. But they they're going to obviously in countries like Malawi yeah. assume a real leadership position right. in the Absolutely. community. Yeah, but yeah. they haven't been taught the leadership. No, 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 exactly. And that's why I mean the pressure on them is extraordinary. You know, that's not fair. I don't think. And mm. and it's the same with even now with um, you know people working anywhere in in health. We shouldn't be putting people in positions. Where they don't have the skills, and we should, you know, at least introduce them and, and support them. And a lot of this stuff can be done better with good support systems over time, with either coaching or regular sort of feedback or constant support, or them forming, you know, sort of groups themselves where they're they're learning from each other. And in doing that job in Malawi. Yeah. Uh, do you have a board overseeing what you're doing? Uh, no. Well, I mean, I'm. I'm actually you're the work- board. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I'm working. I'm a, I have an appointment with the college of medicine, yeah. um, so I'm responsible to the you know the, the school head um, and 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 to the principal of the of the college, and, and they're part of the University of Malawi. Uh, they're in fact, going to become their own university very soon, so they will have their own university council. But there's a university council, but. Um, you know, there it's it's um, you know I feel a sense of accountability and responsibility that to who to the people I work with, but also to the students. Um, so you know it, it's important that you have a a sense of accountability to to whom you're working for as well. Mm. So when you talk about their um, you know lack of resources mm. and obviously a lack of boards, and yeah, that, sure. Back here in Australia, yeah. Uh, Every board, whatever the field of endeavour mm. is, have got all the resources they need, surely, yeah, to, well, do, to mean, do a very good job. Yeah, no, I mean, in terms of, I, I think if you look, I mean, visually, sort of, you know, in Australia, there are the problems, right? Mm. And there are the resources, right? right. Malawi's yeah. gone like that. So, you know, we, we have, we can do a lot, and we do do a lot very well. I think the, but the better we get at, at, at sort of managing, um, the resources that we have and managing the people and supporting the people, uh, the better we'll do. 
So uh, coming right back to our situation then in, in Australia, and we're talking about uh, the roles and responsibility of boards, the makeups of boards, and you're saying you know they've got problems here and resources mm. in there, so mm. got plenty of things uh, to do, yeah. but in their favour as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and we like to think, oh well, they're going along well, everything seems to be working all right. Yeah. But as we find from time to time, things aren't always working as well as they yeah. should be. Not only with what the boards are doing, but the board's own internal workings. Yep. Yep. Um, how do you go about then assessing or evaluating or you know checking on how your, your board is going at any given time? Well, I mean, obviously the way of, we talked before about skills matrix and actually yep. finding out you know and getting people to assess their own level of uh, of skill sort of openly, I think, and honestly, and encouraging people to be able to talk about. It. I mean, one of the great things of of the way that good teams work is that people, if they can express some vulnerability, you know, I mean, it's very hard to work with perfect people, um, but when you can say, well, look, you know, I'm good at this, but maybe not so good at, and, and what are you good at? Um, and uh, how do we build a sense of what we are good at as a group? Uh, and where do we have areas that we need to work on, um, both as individuals and as a group? Uh, that notion of self-assessment can be really incredibly important. Um, and also if you can follow it through in time. So in other words, if you can see you're actually improving in some of those areas, just as I was saying before, you know, in decision making, you know, I can see that I've got better at decision making or I've got better at time management uh, over time because I've actually really tried to practice it and get feedback or I've got better at, at um, presentations. Why? Because it's about feedback and about practice. And what do you, Rob Moody, think you've got better at since you were first a chairman? Well, one is a sense of the role is that, you know, I don't have to run the show and it doesn't, it's my, my view isn't the most important. My job is to, is, as I say, is to conduct the orchestra, not to play every instrument um, and or kick, you know, be on every position on the, on the football field. So I think that notion of sort of where do you really fit in and what's your role, it's to help the group work. Why? Because you want to make sure they're supporting the executive in the best possible way and they're helping to really set the strategic direction and make sure it's happening. But, um, you know, that... And so communication is really important, I think, obviously. Relationships are really important. Um, maintaining your own, what they call emotional intelligence, so that you're, you know, you maintain balance and you're aware of what you are and the effect you have on other people and you can actually not lose your cool, uh, you know, those sorts of things. Are Did really you ever fun. lose your cool oh, as a chairman? Of course you do. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Less now, maybe that's age, but I mean, uh, um, occasionally you can, um, uh, and I heard very, very good um, advice from, in a, from a, a woman called Helen Evans last week, um, who was actually the, the head of uh, the Global Fund on AIDS and also Garvey, the Australian woman back in Melbourne now. And she said, um, Never lose your temper unless strategically. <laughs> <laughs> Great, you know, sort of, she was very calm, cool, collected, but I mean, if she really wanted to get a point across, then uh, she'd make sure people knew about it. Mm. And I think you've said in the past, um, we practice for everything, uh, but we don't practice for being on a board. So there's something to practice. Yeah, well, I mean, keeping you cool well, unless it's strategic. Well, I mean, I, it fascinates me. We're having, you know, thinking about this discussion, and it was a, particularly around, you know, your interest in sport, and, I, and I've got the same level of interest. I think, or music, or theatre. You know, all that is about practice, 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 then perform. Whereas in our daily work, and and the boards are a good example of this. We work, 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 and don't do much practice. So we're not really going back and saying, well, what are the skills we need? You know, we're we're um, we're kicking at the goals, but we haven't gone back and, and actually practised it. And then when you've done all that and you do yeah. your job, what about the sense of satisfaction? You get, as well as part of that evaluation should be able, the ability to sit back and not be and self-centred. So I would say, gee, we've done I'm a I'm making progress, here. yeah. I mean, as a team, I mean, hopefully, as you would say, you know, we've done better uh, as a team. I've also done better. I've actually skilled up. And I think the fabulous thing about you know being on school councils, hospital boards, you know, it's a fabulous way to learn. I mean, you learn not only about the skills that you can develop, you learn from your other members because they've got skills 
and experience and contacts and networks that maybe you don't. I mean, that was what I love about being on the board, uh, storm board. I mean, because you know, I met people who had great skills in, in areas that I had none at all, uh, and I really started to learn from them. Uh, and I think it's you know, wherever those opportunities arise, if you can sort of take them on openly and honestly and learn, bingo, it's really good for you. Mm. Well, having been through the storm experience <laughs> and learned plenty from that, you might be uh, the uh, the man to be the next chair of the ABC board. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, uh, very large hot potato. Uh, yeah. you might, that would make yeah. you my boss. Yeah. I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, great to talk to you today Thanks, about uh, governance and, yeah. and, uh, and, and your work on boards yeah. and as a CEO. And I trust that everyone viewing has um, been able to take plenty away from it. And... Uh, in particular, all the best with your ongoing endeavours in Malawi. Thank you very much, Ian. Terrific. It's been a pleasure. Dr Rob Moody's been our very special guest today.